Job chapter 6. It's where we find ourselves tonight, having made our way through the first five chapters of Job last Sunday night. It's important for us as we begin in this second week here in this book that we turn back to the very first chapter and the very first verse and freshly recognize what God's estimation was of this man by the name of Job. And we're told that there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. I'll tell you, that's a great estimation of of any life. No willful disobedience, no sin mentioned there, nothing like that at all. And so that was God's assessment of Job. There's a grand canvas, so to speak, of that constitutes the background of Job's life and of our life. And what was going on in his life had nothing to do with his righteousness or unrighteousness or anything. There was a lesson that God was going to teach all of heaven and all of the earth through this man's life. But it meant that this man was going to go through a great and terrible and difficult trial in order to uh, teach Satan a lesson, for the angelic beings of heaven to learn a lesson, and for God's people to receive the comfort, comfort that we have received through the ages in the reading of this book of Job in the time of our trials. One of the great difficulties is that while Job is in this trial that lasts for a period, it's estimated of about six months, He doesn't have any idea what it is that God is doing. And that's hard. It's one thing to know what what's at the end of it. Oh, double what I began with, and all right, okay, you know. And and, but he doesn't know where this thing is going to end. This thing has come out of the blue, the loss of everything materially, the loss of his family, the loss of his wealth, the loss of his health, and he has no idea where it's going to end. Now we have more than he has. He, he was probably, as we saw last week, a contemporary of Abraham. So the law wasn't even written yet. Mo, you know, Moses wasn't even on, on the scene you know, yet. We have the advantage of when we find ourselves in those deep trials of being able to turn to the book of James, to turn to First Peter and to Second Peter and gain that needed perspective. Okay, this is what God is doing. And this is where it's leading. But that silence can be so hard to deal with in trials of that depth. But if the Lord was to reveal the purpose, then it would cease to be producing what it was producing. Because then Satan could just come back to God and say, well, of course they love you as as long as nothing is demanded of them in terms of faith. As long as their love isn't tested, they love you. See, so... God had to sit in that place while all of this was unfolding. And sometimes we suffer, and we never know why. Job is going to find out, but he's going to have to endure three so-called friends for a while before that happens. We pick it up in chapter 6. Job has laid out his complaint after his friends showed up. He was silent for seven days. They were silent with him. They'd have done good if they'd have been silent for five months and three more weeks. Uh, and just finished out the whole six months silent, but they uh, have uh, you know some things that they want to say, and so Job is you know laying out his complaint, wishing he was dead, and all of that because of the trial that he was in. And then Eliphaz in chapter four, he decides that he's going to give them the answer, Job, the answer for why he's in the trial, and it's got to be because there's sin in Job's life. And so you know Job cries out, and and the, the uh, can, you know Job. Uh, cries out now in ch- chapter 6 against that accusation. Job answered and he said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed and my calamity laid with it in the balances, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore, my words have been rash. Now, Eliphaz has rebuked Job, and Job said, Listen, give me a break. I've lost my ten kids. Uh, my wife is telling me to curse God and die. I've lost the entirety of my wealth. I'm covered with boils. There's pus coming out of them and worms in them. 
and I'm sitting at the, in an ash heap at the dump of my city, and I voice my complaint to my friends, and you rebuke me. And he said, you know, if I could, if, if I could express the weight of the trial that I'm in, it would be heavier than all of the sand of the sea. That's heavy stuff. Wet sand is heavy. All of the wet sand in the world, that's heavy. That's, that's what he's feeling. So he said, sure I spoke, but this is the condition that, that I'm in. And, you know, if my words have been rash, then try and understand that. Verse four, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. In other words, I've become his target and my spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. This trial is so big that I can't measure it. And then he cries out, um, and, and he is going to declare to them, listen, I'm complaining, but I've got reason to complain. He said, does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? No, when it has grass, it doesn't bray at all. Why? Because there's no reason for it to. Or does the ox low over its fodder? Not too busy eating it. There's no reason for it to low. Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They're loathsome food to me. And so he's saying, listen, I'm complaining but there's a reason for my lowing. There's a reason for my brain. You know, there's a, a reason for my complaints. He said, oh, that I might have my request, that God would grant me the thing that I long for. And so what do you long for, Job? That he, it would please God to crush me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off, that God would just kill me, that I would have, uh, then I would still have comfort Though in anguish I would exalt, this is, to die is better than the condition that I'm in. Let him not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. What strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? What good is longer life here? He's trying to get them to understand the difficulty of his trial. Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh bronze? Uh, is my help not within me and success is driven from me? And so now he's going to instruct his friends on how to deal with a person in his uh, situation. He's going to say, now listen, this is how you do hospital visitations. Or this is how you deal with people that are in, in deep trial. You obviously haven't taken a course on it the way you're talking to me. He said to him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend. That's all he wanted. Just wanted just one out of the three, just to be kind to him. So he, he wasn't looking for a, a theological discussion from them, and that's all they're going to give him. They're going to they're going to talk to him about you know all of this theology and all of this unknown stuff and everything. He said, all I wanted from you was just some kindness, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away. I look at you guys coming and you look like a stream of water coming my way. Now remember, he's on an ash heap covered with sores. And I mean, just a cool drink of water. Oh, you look like refreshment coming my way and you didn't turn out to be refreshing at all. You, He said, which are dark, verse 16, because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. Oh, you look like it was going to be ice cold water coming. Oh, man. He says, when it is warm, they cease to flow. And when it is hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside and they go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tima look and the, for the travelers of Sheba hope for them. And they're disappointed because they were confident they come there and are confused. And so when these, you know, traveling groups would come to where they were supposed to find water and not find it, you know, you can imagine the disappointment. You're going across the desert there in that Middle Eastern area and you go, oh man, it's just another day and we're going to hit water. And then you get to the place where you're supposed to find it and there's no water. I mean, that's pretty disappointing. We can relate to that, 105, 106 degree weather. You know, you can imagine. And, and he said, that's what I was hoping from from you, but boy, I, I couldn't get a drop of refreshment from you. He said, for now you're nothing. You see terror and afraid. 
Did I ever say, bring something to me? Did I call for you? Did I ask you to bring something to me or offer a bribe for me for your wealth or deliver me from the enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the oppressors? I didn't ask for your help. And I certainly didn't, you know, ask for you to bring me fear and terror with your silly man-made visions. He said, teach me and I'll hold my tongue. Cause me to understand where I've erred. How forceful are right words, but what does your arguing prove? Do you intend to reprove my words and the speeches of a desperate one, which are as wind? Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless, and you undermine your friend. Now, therefore, be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. He's saying to them, essentially, listen, you're, you're great at giving speeches, Eliphaz. A wonderful, wonderful piece of poetry you declared to me in your condemnation of me. But don't speak in generalities concerning me. If you're hearing from God so clearly, then tell me what my sin is. And, and Job is upset. And you know, sometimes you, today there's that idea that whenever this kind of calamity as it relates to the loss of wealth or the loss of health, that it has to do with some kind of sin in a person's life. And it's always spoken those general terms. And Job comes against it and says, Listen, don't talk to me like that. If you know something from God, then God's going to show you specifics. Tell me the exact sins that are in my life. Because I certainly don't know them. If he's reve- He hasn't revealed to you just enough to torture me. If He's going to reveal something to you, He's going to reveal something that's going to have a place of solution here. In, in my life. And so he asks for what the specific sins are in his life. Turn now the, and let, verse 29, let there be no injustice. Yes, turn again. My righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? And he's speaking about the words that they spoke. He said, you bring nothing. No, you accuse me of no sin. You say that it's because of sin that I'm in this condition. But he says, you accuse me of no sin. None of you have seen me sin. None of you have seen me be unrighteous. And so he's, he's really you know, rebuking them uh, in, in all of this. And again, all that Job is saying to them at the beginning is this. Listen, I didn't want you guys to come and debate theology with me. I just wanted you to be kind with me. Just to be kind to me while I'm trying to figure out what in the world is happening here. And that's all, that, that's all that Job wanted, and I'm sure that's all that the Lord wanted these comforters to do. And, and, uh, but they didn't do it. They, they felt like they had to have an answer for everything. Chapter 7, Job says, Is there not a time of hard service for man on the earth? And he's saying, Listen, can't, can't things like this happen just because life is hard, this side of glory? You know, if it rains on the just and the unjust... Can't there be trials for the just and the unjust? Does it, does it have to have some kind of a meaning associated with sin here? And so he says, Is there not a time of hard service for man on the earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires shade, and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages at the end of the day? So I have been allotted months of futility and wearisome nights have been appointed me to me. When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be ended? For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. It, it, you know, the chronically ill have that. And you ever been sick? Sometimes even if you're not chronically ill, you get the flu or some kind of a deal like that, and you're awake all night, you sleep for 20 minutes, and you look over and you hope it's going to be 4 in the morning, but it's just 11 at night. And you go, just 11 at night. <laughs> and you know, you've already sweated all over the sheets four times and it is 11 at night and the fever is supposed to break just the first time. And you know, the nights are miserable like that. And imagine in his condition where you can't find, you know, because of the boils and a comfortable position. You know, when the night starts to go, in that, that condition, when the sun starts to go down, uh, it's the worst. It's just, oh no, here comes you know the night again. And so he says, I've had my fill of tossing till dawn. Verse five: My flesh is caked with worms and dust, and my skin is 
cracked and it breaks out afresh. And though my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope, oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. In other words, Job's saying, um, God, if you're going to do something, you better do it quick because I'm going to die. And, and that's, that's how he feels. This, I, I'm, head, I'm headed into the grave. Yeah, nobody's going to see me anymore. While your eyes are upon me, he says, verse 9, I shall no longer be. I'm going to die right before your eyes. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him any more. And so, just the depth of the trial. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. He, compl- he pours out his complaint now to God. He's not going to talk to these guys anymore right now. He said, therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit, and I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. He says to God, am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set a guard over me? God, am, am I so dangerous? Am I so dangerous that you need to put me out of commission like this? Am I a danger to humanity? Was I a danger to my age? Was I a danger to my family that you would, you know, chain me with infirmity in, in this way? And then when I say, my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, he said, then you scare me with dreams and you terrify me with visions so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let, let me alone, for my days are but a breath. And so, you know, Eliphaz had gotten a vision from the Lord, you know, and he had the hair shanning up on his arms, and it was a vision of his own making. And, it was God's, uh, and you know, Job says to God, listen, you know, and then I try to sleep, and this Eliphaz over here is giving me these scary visions and, and flipping me out with all of this. Verse 17. What is man that you should magnify him that you should set your heart uh, uh, on him that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment lord why do i have so much of your attention right now maybe somebody else should have some attention how long will you not look away from me and let me alone till i swallow my saliva just give me a minute have i sinned Or what have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I'll no longer be. I'm going to be dead. And so he's saying, listen, God, if if I have committed sin against you, what is my sin and why don't you tell me? And God wasn't telling him that he was. Uh, this was all because of his sin, because that's not the reason why. Well, Bildad, the second of the three comforters, decides to jump in, and what a comforter he is. And so he counsels now Job, and Bildad the Shuhite, shortest man in the Bible. All right, okay, sure. It's an old gag, it's a lousy one, but it lets me know you're still with me. Don't get all haughty. You'll be tempted to use it someday. (laughs) He said, How long will you speak these things and the words of your mouth be like a strong wind? Job, you're full of hot air. And and, he's saying this to a man who wants to die. You know... um, Hello, get a grip on you, you know what the situation that you're you're in in the middle of here. You know, as some kind of counselor, some friend. Does your mouth, your words of your mouth are like a strong wind? Does God subvert judgment, or does the Almighty pervert justice? And so now He is going to give Job a lecture on the righteousness and the judgment of God. Oh, goody! That, that's just what Job wants. Is a nice, you know, eight part series, because that's about how many times he's gonna share the same theme 
on the judgment of God. <laughs> it's a little, a little mercy, you know, might be uh, nice in all of this. One of the things about Bildad that I think is interesting here in chapter 8 is we read through it. And one of the reasons that Bildad comes on as strong as he comes on is he's a certain kind of man who exists in great numbers in the body of Christ today. And he's the kind of man that must have God figured out to the nth degree. He is not comfortable with a God who is bigger than his theology, bigger than Bildad's theology. There are people in the body of Christ that just are not comfortable with the fact that God is even bigger than he can describe in his word. Now, I'm not saying that we argue from silence from the Scriptures for practice in the body of Christ, but again, the finite human being can only take the infinite God out so far before we begin to smolder in our brains. We, we just can't do it. And so, when a person will not admit that God has revealed as much as He can about His ways concerning this issue in His Word, and we can understand these situations to this point, but once we go beyond that point, it's speculation, and we don't know what's really going on. If you can't admit, admit that, then what I find myself doing is starting to deal with the Scriptures in a way that I say, God always works this way in this situation. Again, they got to have them figured out. God always heals. God always heals immediately. Or God always does this. He always does it this way. And, and it's really, to me, it's a lack of, in many ways, of faith in, in God and a lack of really knowing who He is. He can be rested in concerning the questions. Again, as it relates to the sovereignty of God, that He is almighty. The sovereignty of God is a very true doctrine. He does what He wants, when He wants, how He wants, with who He wants. He's God. But I also must understand that the revelation that we have concerning God in the Old Testament and through His Son Jesus is that He is always faithful to use His sovereignty for my good. And I have to trust Him for that. Romans chapter 8. I have to trust Him for that. And so these guys get into trouble because their formula is this. Anyone who suffers like you're suffering, there must be sin in your life. Period. And they're going to get so angry at Job because Job is going to keep destroying their thesis. He's going to prove to them that's not true. The wicked prosper this side of glory and the righteous suffer this side of glory. What you're saying does not hold up in the world that we see around us, let alone the Word of God. But here he is. When a, when a person's got it all figured out, and then, you know, you begin to threaten that, oh man, you got a fight on your hands. I'll tell you, one of the things for me, the older I get in the Lord, the mellower I get. I know it doesn't look like it, but I really am. I really am. And I, ha I don't have the slightest problem anymore. And those of you who come to me, if you ask me some question on something, and, it, and there isn't a clear, you know, biblical answer to it, I, I don't know. I'd be glad to pray with you. I don't have the slightest idea. I don't have any problem saying that at all. And that's one of the great things about, you know, growing older in the Lord. You, you just, you don't have to bluff. You just go ahead and say that, and, and uh, they know when you're bluffing anyway. And so here he's, he's going to come in with this because he's got to have it all tied up. So here he comes with his judgment and justice argument. And he says in verse 4, If your sons have sinned against God, then he's cast them away for their transgression. They died because of sin in their lives. Was that true? That's not true. That's, that's his theology, though. And that's the theology of the other two comforters. And yet it's absolutely wrong concerning the situation. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you, Job, were pure and upright, surely now He would awake for you. The reason you're not hearing from Him is because you're not pure and upright and prosper your rightful habitation, though your beginning was small, yet your latter end would uh, increase 
abundantly. And so, you know, if you just would get the secret sin out of your life, you're going to be okay. And then he says in verse 8, this is an interesting line of logic, again, very common today. He said, for inquire, please, of the former age and consider the things discovered by their fathers. And so now he begins to draw on the teaching of the fathers. What I'm saying to you is right, Job, because the fathers believed it. Now, we live in a society in the United States of America where there is not nearly the respect for the fathers that there was in this Oriental culture and that there is today in the Oriental culture. When a man would say up, stand up and say, this is what the fathers believe, that held a lot of weight. You know, today, one generation after another in this culture fights against the wisdom of, of the fathers until they find out that a lot of times they're right and sometimes they're wrong. And so here he's coming and he's saying, listen, it's not just me that believes this, it's our fathers that believed it. But you know, sometimes the fathers can be wrong and history can be wrong. Sometimes when I'm talking with the Jehovah Witnesses on my doorstep or I'm talking with an unbeliever and they bring up the Crusades and they expect me to jump in and defend the Middle Ages as it relates to the Crusades and Christianity, I said, I, ha I am not compelled at all to defend the fathers of the Middle Ages. Don't you know about the parable of the tares among the wheat? The wheat, there's no evidence that what happened in those ages was a representation of Jesus at all. I'm not going to represent the, you know, defend all of that in there. The fathers were wrong. And just because doctrine has been handed down from person to person to generation to generation to generation doesn't mean anything. What matters is, what does this Bible say? And so he's trying to bolster his case by the fathers, you know, and sometimes it, people will talk about, to me, like spiritual gifts is another classic example. They would say, you know, well, the church fathers held this position. I don't care. I don't, I don't care. It, tell me what they held, and, and I read as much as anybody reads. And I have a respect for scholars and all of that, and I've learned, you know, everything I've learned, you know, so it's like, and, and so I have that respect. But if what they say violates the Word of God, I don't care. I don't care how many of them believed it. Let, let me be free then from it and, and spend my life experience what is the truth of God related to these things. And so they say, well, you know, the fathers taught these things went out. I don't care. What does is, what is 1 Corinthians chapter 13 say? And so here he's following back, uh, falling back on the fathers. He said, for we are but of yesterday and know nothing. We're just whippersnappers compared to the fathers. Behold, our days on earth are a shadow. Will they not teach you and tell you, speaking of the fathers, and utter words from their heart? Will you listen to them, Job? You know, they say the same thing. And then beginning in verse 11, he's going to argue with Job from the fact, he's going to argue from nature that every uh, effect has a cause and so he says, in, in other words, what's happened to you, Job, the reason you're in the condition, the reason there's been this effect in your life is a cause, and the cause is your sin. And so he gets some examples from nature related to it. Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? No, it grows because there's a cause and effect. Can the reeds flourish without water? No, it can't. There's a cause and effect. While it is yet green and not cut down, it withers before any other plant. So are the paths of all who forget God. Job, you've forgotten God. And the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. Job, you're a hypocrite. And whose confidence shall be cut off, and whose trust is a spider's web. Job, you've not been trusting in God, and that's why you're in this place. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. It hold, he holds it fast, but it does not endure. He grows green in the sun, and his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around a rock heap and look for a place in the stones. And if he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him, saying, I have not seen you. In other words, when a gardener pulls a plant out of his garden, he does it for a reason. And so God has plucked Job up out of his place, he's saying, for a reason. Uh, and, and the reason is because of your sin. He said, Behold, this is the joy of God's way, 
and out of the earth others will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. Confess your sin, get right with God, Job, and everything will be okay. Unfortunately, that's not the truth concerning Job's situation. He said, He will fill your mouth with laughing, your lips and your lips with rejoicing. Those who hate you will be clothed with shame, and, the, and they will be at the, at the end of the book. And the dwelling place of the wicked will come to nothing. If you repent, everything's going to be okay. If you, if you repent, then God is going to bless you. That's great counsel. It just doesn't apply to Job. It doesn't have any application to Job at all. And so Job laments now, and he answers Bildad. And he, Job is going to... As you look in verse 19, at the end of it, he says, And if of justice, who will appoint my day in court? Job is going to say all through chapter 9, Listen, I want, a, I want a court hearing with God. I know that sounds stupid. I know it sounds crazy. Job is saying it's madness, but I don't want to talk to these guys anymore. And I want to talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. And so Job answered and he said, Truly, I know it is so, but how can a man be righteous before God? How can I be declared innocent before God? Job knows he is innocent. He knows he's innocent, but he can't get God to defend him. He knows that God should defend him, and God isn't defending him. So how can he get God to defend him before these false accusers? And that's what... He wants God to do to testify on his behalf. He said in verse 3, If one wished to contend with God, he could not answer God one time out of a thousand. You're always going to flunk that test. And everyone flunks it at the end of the book, which is one of the great greatest sections of the Scripture, the end of this book. He said, God is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who has, hard, who has hardened himself against God and prospered. He removes the mountain, and they do not know when he overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth out of its place, and its pillars tremble. He commands the sun, and it doesn't rise. He seals off the stars. He alone spreads out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. He made the bear, Orion and the Pleiades, speaking of the, you know, the galaxies and all, and the chambers of the south. And he does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without, nu without number. He says, yes, I know God is that big. I know He's that powerful. But, and, but I'm having a little trouble talking to Him right now and getting Him to answer me back. And you notice what he says here. I like it in verse 11. He said, for if God goes by me, I, I do not see Him. God can sneak up on you. The terrible disadvantage. If he moves past, I do not perceive him. If he, if he takes away, who can hinder him? Who can stop him? Who can say to God, what are you doing? God will not, God will not withdraw his anger. The allies of the proud lie uh, prostrate beneath him. And how then can I answer him? He, he says, I know I'm talking crazy. I'm, I'm talking, this is madness talking about you know, calling on God and then having a day in court before God. But he says, you know, I, I've got to, I want to bring my innocence forth. How then can I answer him and choose my words to reason with him? For though I, I were righteous, I couldn't answer him. I would beg mercy of my judge. If I called and he answered me, I would not believe that he was listening to my voice. For he crushes me with a tempest and multiplies my wounds without cause, and he will not allow me to catch my breath, but fills me with bitterness. If it's a matter of strength, indeed he's strong, and if of justice, you want to talk to me about justice, who will appoint my day in court? Though I were righteous, my mo own mouth would condemn me. Though I were blameless, it would prove me perverse. He says, again, he says, I'm talking crazy, you know, going to plea my case before God, and Who's righteous before God? But I know that I'm not, you know, uh, these are false accusations that are being made against me. And then now he rebukes uh, Bildad's argument that if he'll just do what's right and repent of his sin, everything will be okay. 
He said, I am blameless, yet I do not know myself. I'm blameless outwardly, but I, I don't know, you know what's in the depths of my heart. I despise my life. It is one thing, therefore I, it is all one thing, therefore I say he destroys the blameless and the wicked. If the scourge slays suddenly, there's one for you. He laughs at the plight of the innocent. The earth is given into the hand of the wicked. He covers the faces of its judges. If it be not he, who else could do it? In other words, he says, hey, the wicked judges are prospering all around us. That kills your idea that the wicked always suffer. And he says, the righteous are, are, are oftentimes you, you destroyed with the wicked. And so that blows apart your argument that the, wick, the, the righteous never suffer. He says in verse 25, now my days are swifter than a runner. I'm going fast. I can't last much longer. And so he lists some swift things. And the first one is a runner. My days are swifter than a runner. And they flee away. They see no good. They pass by like swift sh ships. That's a second swift thing. That's tough to say. And then this guy, now we got a swooping, like an eagle swooping on its prey. And yet, see an eagle, you know, when it swoops down on its prey, whoo, man, it comes, it's fast. And that's what he's saying. My life is going fast. If I say I will forget my complaint, I will put off my sad face and wear a smile. I am afraid of all of my sufferings. I know that you will not hold me innocent. So he's still talking about his day in court. And so he says, Lord, if I show up in your court, and, and he talks there in verse 27, and he says, if I put off my sad face and I put on a smile, brush my teeth, get them all cleaned, and I come into the courtroom perky, you know, and then he, and he says, if I'm condemned, verse 29, then why do I labor in vain? If I wash myself with snow water and cleanse my hands with soap, in other words, not only do I get my face all perky and smiling and my teeth brushed in, but I take a good, nice bath and get all cleaned up and put on some real nice clothes, yet you will plunge me into the pit and my own clothes will abhor me. So, what's he talking about? Um, it's amazing if you ever uh, are in a, uh, have ever been in a, don't raise your hand, uh, but if you've ever been in a court situation where you're trying to make an impression on the judge, do you go in there just looking like riffraff? No, you brush your teeth and get that face all nice and shiny and get a nice haircut, whatever kind of haircut the judge has, depending on the sex of the judge, you know, and and uh, get your nicest suit out and all. Why? To make an impression on the judge or on the jury. And so he's saying, hey, even if I did all of this stuff, wouldn't make any difference in the kind of trial that I'm in. And then he says, for God is not a man, verse 32, as I am, that I may answer him and that we should go to court together, nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. Let him take his rod away from me, and do not let dread of him terrify me. Then I would speak and not fear him, but it is not so with me. And so Job, in one of the most famous verses in the Bible, verse 33, he complains that there's no mediator, no daysman in the old, the old King James. And a daysman was simply a person who had the authority to go between two parties that there was a distance between. And the daysman had the authority to lay his hand on the head of one party and lay his hand on the head of the other party and reconcile them. What the daysmen said went for both parties. And so there was a means when they couldn't communicate, there was a breach between them, the daysman was the one that could bring them together, a mediator. Now, what Job, the person Job is crying out for, of course, is the Lord Jesus. The Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And we've been brought together through Jesus. He is the mediator. So Job's in a place where he doesn't have that, you know, that opportunity to turn to the Lord and for this gulf to be bridged. And that gulf has been bridged in, in Jesus Christ. This is one of the reasons when you look at, um, sometimes people look at the incarnation. Why did 
God have to come in human flesh and, and this kind of thing? And, you know, those are good questions and everything, and you, um, you ought to uh, get some Chuck Missler tapes on that or something and uh, get a good book on it. Those questions give me a headache um, anymore. But uh, you, they look at why the Incarnation, why, and there are answers for it, but why was it necessary that Jesus would be all God and all man all at the same time? And that's one of the names for Jesus is he's the God-man. Not half God, half man. All God, all man, all at once. It was the only way that he could then be a mediator. Because he couldn't, he has to be God to be in contact with the Father and he can't be, you know, he, he's got to also be incarnate to make contact with man. And so the necessity of it in order to be the mediator for the, our sin and the forgiveness of our sin that had separated us from God. And so here he is, he's crying out for Jesus. He's just, uh, you know, a little bit early uh, as it relates to that. Probably when he did die, went into Abraham's bosom and uh, got cleared out of there as we saw uh, last Sunday morning as it relates to Jesus' resurrection. Chapter 10. Job is going to ask the Lord the question, why here in this chapter? He says, my lo- my soul loathes my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I'm not going to hold back. (laughs) I will speak in the bitterness of my soul and I will say to God, do not condemn me. Show me why you contend with me. And so he, he says, if I had a day in court with Job, with God, this is the case that I would lay out. I'd say, show me why you contend with me. Does it seem good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands? I mean, you've put all this work into me, and now you're destroying me. And shine on the counsel of the wicked, speaking of his friends. Do you uh, have eyes of flesh, or do you see as a man sees? Are your days like the days of a mortal man? Are your years like the days of a mighty man? In other words, God... You know everything. You don't have to investigate a situation to bring out the truth. You know what the truth is here. Why don't you bring it out? That's what he's saying. Now, you know, God is going to really rebuke Job at the end of it. Not half as bad as he's going to rebuke those other three guys. But I mean, but, you know, Job is, you know, crying these things out to the Lord. And, and I think just really in fairness to him, if he'd have had three buddies that would have just hung with him and just kept putting his focus on the Lord and just encourage him in the things of the Lord. I think he'd have obviously done a lot better, but now he's having to, it's no comfort at all. He says in verse 6, that you should seek for my iniquity and search out my sin, although you know, they don't know, but you know that I'm not wicked, and there is no one who can deliver from your hand. Your hands have made me and fashioned me an intricate unity. You Yet you would destroy me. Doesn't make any sense to me, God. Remember, I pray, that you've made me like clay. And will you turn me into dust again? Will you, uh, will, uh, verse 10, did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me like cheese? And so the meaning's so obvious, there's no need to, what in the world does that mean? (laughs) Did you not pour me out like milk and curdle me? Like cheese, and so really talking about the embryo, where the embryo goes from that liquid, mostly liquid, to then that you know starts to gain the mass, you know, within in the womb. And so he says, "Hey, you've known about me from you know way back and been involved. And is this how it's all going to end? You've clothed me with skin and flesh and knit me together with." bones and sinews. You have granted me life and favor, and your care has preserved my spirit. And these things you have hidden in your heart. I know that this was with you. If I sin, then you mark me and will not acquit me of my iniquity. If I'm wicked, woe to me. Even if I'm righteous, I can't lift up my head, for I am full of disgrace. See my misery. If my head is exalted, you hunt me like a fierce lion, and again you show yourself awesome against me. You renew your witness against me and increase your indignation towards me. Changes 
and war are ever with me. Now, when you got a friend talking like this, what do you say? You say, whoa, 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 Job, Job, Job. Hey, hey, hey. Take it easy here now. That's not what God, that's not God's heart towards you. That's not what's happening here. Let's look at what God does say concerning you. And, and that's, that's all he needed to have happen to him. And, and yet Zophar is going to jump in in chapter 11. And if, they, if, if Job thought the other two guys were rough, Zophar, is, he's off the graph. Job says in verse 18, he said the same word again. Why have you brought me out of the womb to, for this? Oh, that I had perished and no eye had seen me. I would have been as though I had not been. Wait a second, let me read that again. I would have been as though I had not been. Here's a Grateful Dead sticker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wherever, wherever you go, there you are. I mean, that's right. In, <laughs> I saw that. I saw that sticker on a van one time. Wherever you go, there you are. You know, I thought. I, I, you know, sometimes you see a sticker and you want to get a look at whoever. And uh, <laughs> so I drove up and. And as I drove up next to it, you know, the guy's got a deadhead sticker. Yeah, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Hey, I got it. It's all fitting together for me now, you know. Wherever you go, there you are. And uh, anyway, so I would have been, verse 19, as though I had not been. I would have been carried from the womb to the grave. Are my, not my days few? Cease, leave me alone that I may take a little comfort. Give me a little peace and quiet and let me die before I go to the place from which I shall not return to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. A land as dark as darkness itself as the shadow of death without any order where even the light is like darkness. And so he's talking about death. Now remember, that God hasn't given His Word. He hasn't given the Law and the Prophets, much less the New Testament. So his ideas concerning death, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Sometimes, for instance, when you're on your front doorstep and the Mormons come by or Jehovah Witnesses come by or uh, those kind of groups, and they'll many times uh, will take you into the book of Ecclesiastes or they'll take you into the book of Psalms, sometimes into the book of Job. And, and again, Ecclesiastes is Solomon writing about life under the S-U-N. Life just in the natural, without taking God into account. In other words, when we read about Job, when we read Ecclesiastes, when we read some of the figurative speech in the Psalms, we have to understand that, that a lot of it is just a person that doesn't know what he's talking about. And if you read the whole book, that's the context of it. You can't draw doctrine from, from those things. And so, you know, somebody pulls you in and says, hey, right here in Job 10, we have a good look at, you know, a thorough picture as it relates to death. No, we don't. He doesn't know what he's talking about here. He's just talking, and God is recording it. He's not affirming it. Chapter 11. Then Zophar, uh, the Namathite, answered and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? Uh, and should a man full of talk be vindicated? Job, do you think you're right just because you can talk longer than the rest of us? Now, the interesting thing is that if you take the length of the messages, Job is go speaking a lot longer than his comforters. But he's having to answer their accusations. So they're saying, hey, you're just going on and on, dominating the conversation and everything, and hey, you think you're going to wear us out with just talking long and everything? No siree, we've got some things to say. And there's three of us. And so here he comes and he says, should a man full of talk, you big windbag, I mean, every one of them have called him that. Uh, you know, uh, oh. <laughs> you know, if I hadn't been guilty of it myself, you know, I'd be harsher. You know, and especially, when you're, especially early in the ministry, you just feel compelled to have an answer for everything. And, and as, as I've said, and one of the things that's hard is like, as, as you begin in our service to the Lord, um, you, there, you don't have a wealth of experience yet. Not that anyone feels that they do, but you haven't come into contact maybe with a lot of pain. 
and a lot of difficulties and a lot of different situations that people find themselves in that mellow you out and, and, and teach you the lessons that these men were going, going to need to learn. And, and so, you know, I, so often, again, I look with embarrassment at, you know, what I said in different environments that it would have just been better like these three just not to say anything. Now, let me say this. I never said anything like what these guys are saying, though. I mean, they are in a league of their own. Verse 3, Should your empty talk make men hold their peace? And when you mock, should no one rebuke you? And so it seems like Zophar is just a little upset. And so he says in verse 4, For you have said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in your eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open His lips against you. Now God is going to speak and open His lips, but it's going to go real bad for Zophar. It's not going to go bad so bad for Job. Oh, that God would speak and open His lips against you, that He would show you the secrets of wisdom, for they would double your prudence, and know therefore that God exacts from you less than your iniquity deserves. What happened to you, Job? You deserved a lot worse than that. Well, thank you very much for that. <laughs> it's like coming up to someone in that situation and, and you, know, you speak to them and say, Listen, things could be worse. Could, could, could they really? Could, they re could you tell me how they could be worse? They couldn't be worse. They couldn't be worse. How can you tell a man You've lost your ten children. You've lost all your health. You've lost all of your wealth. And what you deserve for your iniquity is worse than that. I mean, what kind of a comforter is that? It's terrible. Just absolutely cruel. He said, can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? Are they, uh, they are higher than heaven. What can you do deeper than Sheol? What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he passes by, imprisons, and gathers to judgment, then who can hinder God? Who are you to question God, Job? That's what he's saying. For God knows deceitful men. You're deceitful, Job. He sees wickedness also. And will he not then consider it for an empty-headed man... Uh, will be wise when a wild donkey's colt is born a man. Job, I've been listening to you, and you sound empty-headed to me, and it didn't, just doesn't sound like you're teachable at all here. doesn't sound like you're going to be teachable until a donkey, wild donkey gives birth to a man. It, you know, <laughs> spare me the poetry. And so this is what he's laying out, calling him empty-headed for... If you would prepare your heart, right back to the same old, confess your sin and then everything. If you would prepare your heart and stretch out your hands towards God, if iniquity were in your hand and you put it far away and would not let wickedness dwell in your tents, then surely you could lift up your face without spot. Yes, you could be steadfast and not fear because you would forget your misery and remember it as waters that have passed by. Repent of your wickedness. Repent of your iniquity. All oh, this will end, Job. And your life would be brighter than the noonday. Though you were dark, you would be like the morning, and you would be secure because there is hope. Yes, you would be... Um, yes, you would dig about you and take your rest in safety. You would also lie down, and no one would make you afraid. Yes, many would court your favor, but the eyes of the wicked, Job, they're going to fail, and they shall not escape. And what's their hope? Loss of life. Job, if you don't repent, you're going to die. And so that's you know the final word of, of, well, of this particular phase of Zophar's 